Um, and I'm also the public policy advocate at Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. So I'm going to go over why this coalition came together. Um, in the summer of 2019, a group of advocates from nonprofits came together to ask a question of what would a racial equity agenda at the Capitol look like? Um, it would only focus on issues that are specific to racial equity. And so last year, we realized that bonding would be very specific to racial equity because of the governor's proposal of equity and bonding. And so um, some of the proposals were money for outreach and Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities to learn what bonding was and why it matters, uh, workforce diversity certificates for state bonding projects, and $30 million cash to Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. And so those proposals were all related specific to racial equity, whereas legislation such as paid family and medical leave would also have strong racial equity impacts. However, um, it wouldn't, it's not solely focusing on uh, black and brown folks, you know, people of color um, communities. And so uh, we felt that bonding would be the best way to go and, and kind of lift up our coalition to, um, start focusing on racial equity issues that impact uh, communities that might not know what bonding was. And so uh, we are a group of nonprofits working to ad advance racial equity within our organization and our advocacy at work at the Capitol and within our own personal lives as well. Uh, we do need to lift up the fact that we are mainly white uh, and dominant, white dominant organizations. And so it can be tricky to be in a coalition like this um, because on one hand, we should be doing this work because we have a duty to do it because uh, of our resources and capacity, but a lot of times, um, and also recognizing a lot of times that um, Black-led, um, uh, also any a nonprofit led by a person of color, they're usually, um, that are focused on racial equity, they might not always have a policy person to uh, take this work on. And so we do recognize in the future that we will be growing um, in terms of racial diversity, geographic diversity, uh, issue area and organization size. And so we also wanna make sure we're not transactional in any of our relationships. And I do wanna point out that we do have joy in our coalition name because we find that um, racial equity work is really hard. It can be very emotional and very draining. And um, when we met in person, that joy would be um, chocolate. We had, we would always share chocolate or some type of sweets um, within the coalition meetings. And it was really fun. And so we really just want to see Minnesota as a place where um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color can thrive. You know, I'm sure we have all know that Minnesota is a great place to live, but really if you're white. And it's not true for all um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, folks because we have some of the worst racial disparities in the nation. And so we really have to address that, disrupt systems of white supremacy, and advance racial justice and racial equity in Minnesota so uh, we can all call it a great state to live in. And so I will pass it over to Clark to talk about what we're working on for this legislative session. Thanks. Uh, my name is Clark Goldenrod. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a member of the Racial Equity and Joy Coalition and also the Deputy Director of the Minnesota Budget Project. So, so yeah, talking about our work this year. So our work as a coalition is two-pronged. So um, one, um, we're working we're focusing on supporting BIPOC community members getting involved in the budget process through education and a racial equity impact assessment of budget processes and structures. And an important tool I'm gonna to lift up uh, is the racial equity impact assessment pocket guide from Voices for Racial Justice. Um, and two organizations within the coalition, um, the Budget Project and Voices for Racial Justice have been hosting discussions around the state budget process um, and the intersections of racial equity this session. And then two, we're also pushing for the need for specific investments in racial equity in the state's budget. Um, and as Ileana was saying, um, you know, due to this legacy of racist policies and structures, black communities, indigenous communities, undocumented communities and other communities of color continue to be um, more adversely impacted by the health and economic impacts of the COVID induced recession than white communities. Um, and we, we're seeing the recent February forecasts, um, $1.6 billion surplus means that the state has an opportunity to um, begin to make the bold investments that our state's economy will depend on and policymakers will need to make sure that Minnesota has the resources to sustain these investments and build an equitable future. Uh, several of our individual organizations will be advocating 
um, that those still doing well in today's economy to be part of an equitable revenue raising sol solution. Um, and we know that revenues are in some ways necessary, but not sufficient for making sure that the state is investing in BIPOC Minnesotans. Um, the state's budget shows what and who we value as a state, and we hold as a coalition that the path to a stronger and more equitable recovery um, is through greater investment in the health, well-being, and economic stability of Black, Indigenous, and people of color in Minnesota. So that's about the Racial Equity and Joy Coalition, and I'm going to pass it to Serene. Um, thank you all again for being here. So I do want to recognize that in St. Paul, where they meant to be streaming this, there's a power outage. So uh, we've got a couple of people who couldn't make it because of that, and we're still working out some of those technical details. But if you're watching this, we're streaming on Facebook as well. Um, so my name is Serene, like I said, uh, pronouns are she, her. I am the executive director for the Uptake Community News Organization uh, based out of the Twin Cities. Um, I had the privilege of coming on as executive director two years ago, and we began bringing on a new team of freelance journalists and community members um, to become journalists. So we provide training and we say we train from pitch to promotion. And part of the reason that we're having this conversation today is because we wanted to have a conversation around the budget, but in one that lifts up the power of community media and that lifts up the power of our communities to ask serious questions and have serious conversations around the dollar signs that control so much of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, as a point of pride and privilege, I am so proud of our team today who developed an incredible set of questions, not a fluffy one in the bunch, that helps us make sense of the budget, that helps us bring clarity to this. Um, but because we're also a collaborative organization, we felt it was really important that we bring in our partners. So uh, we're still waiting for our representative from North News to be here. Uh, Mickey from the Women's Press is here. Others were invited and are watching the stream. Uh, for us, it's very important to say we're collaborators. We believe in the power of community media in building an ecosystem that builds us all up um, in training people to be journalists. So many people here are people that we are training to be journalists um, and get that, you know, get paid for that work at the same time. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think the governor should be on in just a couple of minutes, but um, I just want to say that this is a really wonderful opportunity for all of us. And you can check out more about the uptakes work at theuptake.org. We host trainings on a weekly basis, um, either Tuesdays or Saturdays. Uh, we do those in partnership as well. So we have a training coming up next Saturday with the, uh, with the East Side Freedom Library. And we're also even planning a series of trainings for this summer with a couple of different organizations, but I'll, I'll keep the lid on those for now. Um, does somebody from the governor's office wanna say something real quick? All right, I'm not. Hi. Happy Sorry, one second here. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not going to be on camera. <clears throat> uh, really appreciate Serene and the coalition for creating the space. Um, we are very excited to, you know, be in a space where there is a lot of community media. Um, and I just want to honor that and hope that we can partner um, in the future as well. But the governor and lieutenant governor should be here very shortly and they are also very excited to uh, talk about their bu budget proposal. Thank you. Wonderful. Now we do have quite the serious list of questions. We're gonna try and get through that. So just as a point of clarification, um, each one of the reporters who are here who are prepped to answer, uh, ask a question, we pulled their names from a hat. Um, they'll, we'll just go in that order. We'll try and get through the first list and then uh, we will move on to the second, um, you know, to the second list of questions. This is really an opportunity to take questions that we're getting from community, from our audience, from our own work in the legislature and say, you know, this is what the work is. This is what we're trying to put priority to. Um, so as you can see, some people are still joining in. Um, I'm assuming all the names I don't recognize are from the governor's office. Um, and we're still streaming. Um, so this is wonderful. Does anybody want to talk about their experience as a legislative reporter while we're waiting? No, I'm a teacher. I will call on somebody. 
Oh, actually the governor's here. So that's beside the point. Hey, governor. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Slightly nervous, but we're all good. Well, it, thank you for having me. Beautiful day. Thank you for being here. It is a gorgeous day. It really, really is lovely. So, um, um, I, are you still waiting for the lieutenant governor as well? Flua? I believe so. She. We just came off of another call with legislators, so I'm sure she'll be coming on just any moment. Wonderful. Well, then... Um, We'll wait for her, but if you want to do a quick introduction, I mean, I know we all know who you are, but maybe about your what you're hoping to get out of today, we can start. Sure, sure. You let me know when you're ready. You can start now. Well, again, thank you. And, and thanks to Racial Equity and the Joy Coalition. I'm, uh, it's an honor to be with you. Um, I'm going to give a, a shout out to Dominique McCurry and, and the folks over at Wilder for the work that, uh, that you are doing, making sure that uh, community engagement and equity is at the center of all decisions that are made in in state government. Um, we know, and we're gonna have a discussion today uh, around those issues to center that. We have a budget discussion coming up and we have made it clear, the Lieutenant Governor and myself, that a budget is a fiscal document, but more importantly, it's a moral document. It's a reflection of your values and, and how you view a budget and how you view the impact it has on people's lives um, will tell you an awful lot whether equity is truly there. Uh, we wanna have and hear from you too about how we, how we measure equity. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you, um, if you really care about something, you're willing to measure it and you're willing to set goals to try and reach. So I, for one, am, uh, am grateful to be here. I look forward to the questionings. We want to make sure the time's there and the outreach um, to reporters and media who are essential to our democracy to ask the hard questions, expect to get answers. And then importantly, right along with that, convey that information to communities that have every reason at times to be uh, skeptical or, or distrustful of where information's coming, whether it's around vaccines uh, because of historical trauma around vaccine abuse of, of communities of color. Um, we need to make sure that, that we're reaching the folks that have the credibility and the ability to reach into community to make sure that that the equity piece around public health is centered. So um, I'm just grateful, look forward to the questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. So um, just as a quick note, my name is Serene, so I'll be your point person if anything comes up or you have any concerns that anybody from your team needs to send to me. Um, I pulled the names out of a hat today in order of questions. We have quite a few for you as I'm sure you saw. Um, Lula. You are up first. And uh, we did try and frame as many of the questions directly around the budget as we could, but we also could not lose the opportunity to have you on a call and ask serious policy questions. So. Um, Very good. Yeah. Uh, Lula, you can introduce yourself. Okay. Then... Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Serene. Um, good morning, everybody. Hi, Governor Wallace. It's really nice to meet you. And it's, it's just a real honor. Uh, my name is Lola Noor, and I'm a legislative reporter with The Uptake. Um, so let me pull up my question here. My question is not uh, specifically about the budget. It's sort of related, um, but it's about an issue that I'm passionate about, which is uh, faith-based equity. So in recent, in recent months and years, Muslim communities and other communities of faith have been advocating for various faith-based needs and religious equity issues. Um, for example, as you're aware, um, locally, we, we, we recently had our Muslim and Jewish Women's Day at the Capitol. In our state legislature, Representative Hodan Hassan has been pushing for a bill to increase religious inclusivity in public school calendars. Um, there's another bill that was uh, introduced regarding Native public school students being allowed to wear their traditional medicine pouches. Um, that was a couple weeks ago. So with that context, um, are there any aspects of this budget that touch on religious freedom or access or intersect with issues impacting religious minorities, whether those are Muslims, Native Americans or others? Um, if so, what should our communities know? And is there any other broader work that you can point to regarding, with, uh, regarding religious inclusivity or religious freedoms that your office is engaging with? So it's a big question, but thank you in advance. Well yeah, thanks, Lo. It's a big one, but it's an important one. Um, so you heard me talk about uh, pretty hard to talk about one Minnesota if you're not addressing the facts that um, of systemic racism, of uh, of anti-Muslim sentiments that rose up, and more recently, anti-Asian Pacific Islander. 
um, the nonsense around the hate to our, our neighbors of, of that descent. Um, I do want to lift up the, the piece of legislation that you talked about, um, making sure that there is equity around religious calendar, um, choice of dress, um, especially as it relates to religious uh, equity. So we are supportive of that. I think if the Lieutenant Governor's on, she was a champion, and I want to give her the full credit for this, of, of thinking how we center equity and, and just some examples of things that seem so simple, but were not happening. Um, for example, in bonding, those are the things we borrow for across the state. May not seem like an issue around where you're talking, but we never had a clear cut percentage that we we made sure went to communities of color and the access of equity and bonding starts to set an expectation of these are not these are not set aside this is not winning the lottery these should be absolute expectations for communities in Minnesota and making sure that we stress those the lieutenant governor has been part of it and I will just in full disclosure claim as a public school teacher we need to do a better job of telling history from all perspectives. And we need to do a better job, especially when that school calendar of our Muslim students um, having to figure out how to leave during Ramadan uh, or being, you know, the things that need to happen. We need to do better. So, Lieutenant Governor, if you've joined us, maybe just uh, a quick note to, uh, to Lola's question. And uh, sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm grateful uh, to be able to, to be with you today. Um, I would just uh, say this. Um, as uh, one of the founding members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus uh, in the Minnesota House before I was Lieutenant Governor, um, saw up close and personal um, what it looked like uh, to um, frankly not be seen, heard, or valued as part of um, a pretty significant institution uh, that made decisions about uh, the lives of, of our communities every single day. And so um, that was uh, one of the reasons why we created the caucus, but also one of the reasons why we tried to be intentional in um, building our budget uh, for you know both last session and this session. Um, and, and as the governor mentioned, one of the pieces that we lifted up in the, the last budget was $30 million. Uh, in bonding, uh, we have included it in year. Um, but uh, the reason that we did that is frankly, um, even when I was in the legislature, uh, it seemed like a lot of um, the agreements and deals that were made were secret handshakes behind closed doors uh, with folks who, uh, didn't look like us um, and people who knew how to hustle and get that money uh, every single session. So um, until we have equity, uh, until uh, there's equitability uh, in, uh, in bonding, um, and that's just the way that it, it happens, uh, we certainly are going to um, uh, make sure that it's included so that funds go to um, organizations led by and for people of color and indigenous folks, um, and that until it becomes simply the way that we do business uh, at, at the Capitol. Um, and I know uh, that the, the question, of course, um, uh, is relating to um, our young people being able to express their, their faith uh, at, at, at school and just in their lives. And one of the things that's been really important to me as a, a Native person has just been the ability for our young people to have access to traditional tobacco um, to express their face. It's certainly something that I've been uh, worked on before I was in this role. Um, and I absolutely think uh, that our young people should be able to have medicine pouches with them. Um, and uh, it's part of uh, who they are and their identity. And, um, and that should be something that's, that's welcome. Thank you all so much. Thank you and welcome to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, if you wanna just do a quick introduction, I know that we know who you are, but anything you might wanna say and then JD is up next on the docket of questions that I pulled out of a hat. Wonderful, well, um, good morning everybody. I am the Lieutenant Governor of, of Minnesota. I'm also a member of the Wider Friend of Ojibwe um, and a recovering member of the Minnesota House um, and former executive director of Children's Defense Fund. Um, and I'm just really excited to be able to be with you uh, today. The Racial Equity and Joy Coalition, um, thank you so much for 
uh, in creating this space and opportunity for us to talk about the budget um, and for uh, the work that you're doing every day. I think in the last year or so, um, many of us have been impacted um, by COVID-19. Uh, I've experienced personal loss and I have to tell you that some days joy is hard to come by. And so um, being very intentional uh, to, to find ways to create conditions where our people can experience joy um, is certainly something that, that I can get behind. So um, I'm not going to take up much more of, of uh, time with a, an intro other than to say I know that representation matters and being at the table matters and knowing that there's a table uh, in the first place also really matters. So um, I'm just grateful to be uh, in this space with you. Welcome to my kitchen. If you were in my house, this is where you would be anyway. Um, so just happy uh, to be with y'all today. Wonderful. JD, you're up. Sure. Uh, good morning, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I guess uh, I have a pretty straightforward question. What impact will $195 million realistically have on affordable housing projects throughout the state? Yeah, well, JD, uh, good to see you and thank you. And again, I hope I hope you've all seen this. I, I understand we're in an age of, of healthy skepticism and then we're in an age of uh, where no one trusts anyone else. And I think actions do matter. Uh, certainly in the business we're in, words don't. Lieutenant Governor and I have, have centered housing. We've, we've been able to secure historic investments uh, in housing. But I think JD's question, and Lieutenant Governor, I may go to you again because you're an expert in this area. Um, I think the question is, is that while this will provide you know, upwards of, of 2,500 residencies and help try and keep people in there, the need is far greater and what 195 million will be able to do. I think what I would say, and I hope all of you are doing what we're going to try and do it and get it out to you. We're dissecting the American Rescue Plan that was that was signed by President Biden yesterday. That piece of legislation has the potential to change lives. By some estimates, we can cut childhood poverty in half with that money. And they're basing a lot of that on stability and home ownership. So I would like to say while we put in significant amounts, it is not enough. It will have an impact. The one thing I would say, JD, is, is that 195 million in, in housing infrastructure bonds and other support from the state leverages about another half a billion in private sector investment. And that's where we get things to grow. But Lieutenant Governor, if you wanna add anything, I, I would just answer to JD's question. While it's historic and we're making progress, we will acknowledge this is a zero sum proposition. As long as one Minnesotan is, is housing insecure. We don't feel like we're done. Um, that's in unsheltered homelessness as well as housing stability and it especially with our children. So Lieutenant Governor, if anything else you want to add? Uh, I would just say uh, I would um, associate myself with the, the remarks that the, the governor just made. Um, you know, this has been uh, Housing insecurity was a crisis uh, before the pandemic, um, and we have tried to do as much as we can um, over the last year to keep people uh, housed as much as we, we can with the eviction moratorium, which has been one of the most important tools in our toolbox um, to do that and need our friends in the legislature uh, to help us uh, to make sure people can stay housed um, after the emergency um, uh, peacetime emergency ends. But I'd say this, it is a good start, um, but we are making up, frankly, um, for uh, years of, of not investing enough. So we are always going to go big um, so people can go home. That's sort of our catchphrase here um, when, it comes to, when it comes to bonding and asking for additional support for um, our relatives experiencing homelessness. Um, but it's a, you know, like the governor said, it's 2,400 homes, um, ability to leverage additional resources, uh, about um, 5,300 annual jobs that will be created uh, by, um, by that bonding. And we know uh, that, that we, we certainly need more. And the way to think about it is we're talking about bonding and building um, is really about scaffolding, right? So that we're doing uh, each, each session um, we are, are building uh, more and more into, um, into the system so that we can actually meet that need. But we have fallen behind. And for the governor and I, our goal is to catch up. Right on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mickey from the Women's Press, you're next. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Serene. This is truly co community-based uh, journalism. 
Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, Minnesota Women's Press theme in March that Serene worked with us on was Transforming Justice. Our April issue is on the MMIR crisis and coming stories are gonna be very much related to trauma-informed uh, response. So I know you quickly included funding for an MMIR office after the task force recommendations came out along with other healing oriented items in the public safety budget. Um, this was based on listening sessions prior to the George Floyd murder and uprisings. My question is what is it about trauma informed healing that, that you think Minnesota needs to get right with this budget? Well, thanks Mickey and, and thanks for, um, for being in a space to ask that question and it's appropriate as we're watching the world watch us as we will see if justice is served and uh, around the death of George Floyd. And um, we understand, and I just wanna name this to everyone, the trauma that was inflicted by George Floyd's murder is building on basically centuries of trauma that's been inflicted on BIPOC communities. With that being said, um, our response as it stands now in terms of um, providing security for folks to be able to uh, express their views I understand and Lieutenant Governor understands um, physical security is not what the only thing communities need. They need that sense of that they're part of that community. And I understand very clearly when more National Guard troops show up in a space that can add to that trauma, um, even though they're there to provide that safety. And so we think this gives us an opportunity. I said it at the end of May and I'll continue to say it. Minnesota needs to get this right around systemic racism and historical trauma now, because we're not gonna get another shot out of it if we don't. And so I think the budgeting items we put in there, the expectations that we want to see, um, not just police training around these issues, but in community and having communities leaders driving this conversation. I think one of the, critique, the critiques that are fair right now is, as we prepared for the George Floyd, you know, George Floyd's justice coming with the Chauvin trial, was there enough outreach to start preparing people for the trauma they feel? Last week, I watched this in front of my home when people came here. Um, they needed a space to grieve. And I'm not certain that we are yet um, have a systematic way of providing that. So we're definitely concerned about this. We are reaching out to folks and researchers in the communities to help us understand this. Um, maybe Lieutenant Governor, we were on several weeks ago, can, can talk about some of the folks we're reaching out to, to help us understand. And again, the state's not gonna do this. The state needs to be a partner in that making this happen. Um, but I am deeply concerned. I'm deeply concerned about, about trauma-informed uh, teaching. Um, every one of our students is gonna come back with, with some level of trauma score um, to school. Many are going to be uh, in need of mental health services. Of, of, of all those other supports. And we wanna make sure, and one of the things we're pushing our summer programming that I went out yesterday and asked the legislature to pass is heavily based on this very, this very need you're talking about. So Lieutenant Governor, any additions? So Nikki, thank you for your question. Um, uh, and thank you for uh, always telling stories that frankly um, don't, uh, that, that not a lot of other folks are telling. Um, and I actually think this is one of those stories. Um, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in our two-spirit community um, has been an issue, um, you know, that is uh, finally, uh, we are now moving towards solutions for um, a very long time. Um, we had to put our trauma on display in order for people to believe what was happening. And I say we, because I'm a, a survivor and child witness and now feel like we are in a space where I can also share those stories because of the work that um, many women uh, have done uh, to lead us to this, this moment. So the missing and murdered indigenous uh, women and girls um, and two spirit uh, work that we did with the task force, that first recommendation, as you mentioned, was to open this office. <clears throat> and part of that is an acknowledgement of the trauma, that this is ongoing. It's not um, something that I think people wish they could just throw some money at and then it's done. We need to be asking the questions, why is this happening in the first place? Why do 
some folks see our women as less valuable. Um, and I oftentimes talk about how at best we are invisible and at worst we are disposable. And that is what the trauma is really about. So um, I think a big piece of this is listening to survivors and that's how we've tried to put um, our, our budget together and respond. Um, but also know that uh, you know building these relationships, allowing uh, survivors to speak on their own behalf uh, is one of the ways that um, we address this, this trauma. And then it's not just about meeting some physical need for folks, it is also about meeting um, a spiritual uh, and, and mental health need as well. Um, and this work is ongoing and uh, I'm grateful that we are now in a place where we're moving on it. The one thing that I wanna say too is that we um, are working with Dr. Joy Lewis and Dr. Brittany Lewis um, on the community on community healing. And they have been our partners in this work. Um, it's, you know, not revolutionary in that, you know, it is work that's bringing the community to, together to be heard so that policymakers can hear uh, and understand the trauma that their communities are experiencing, but also um, ensure that uh, we're taking action based on the recommendations. So this is a series um, of conversations that we've been having with folks and, um, you know, our goal is to see that translated uh, into, um, into policy. But, uh, you know, the state of Minnesota, we talk about this a lot, has been headed in the same direction for 162 years. And so trying to turn the ship is, um, is a tall order. But I think uh, we are in a moment, as the governor said, where we simply have to, to get it done. And um, if folks aren't willing to, to be in that work with us, then they need to just get out of the way. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. And thank you, Mickey, for that question. Um, up next, we have uh, Miss Margaret from Miss Margaret Live, who is a new member of the Uptakes team as well. Good morning, everyone. I am Miss Margaret from Miss Margaret Live. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning. I'm so excited to be here with you, Governor Tim Walls, because anyone who follows my show knows mm -hmm. I've talked to you for a long time time okay i'm always tagging you hoping one day you'll see it so i'm like i'm here today <laughs> and it's now done it's now done it's, so you know yes. it's coming <laughs> exactly exactly in moment of disclarity like a moment before we went live the power in my entire block went out okay and i was like oh my god no because i was the main <laughs> person saying we got this y'all so I look like the phantom right now because I only have lighting on one side of my face and it's the side that my eyelash fell off on. So just a moment of clarity. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, happy to see you as well. We were actually supposed to do a march a few months ago that you were going to be a part of it and got canceled. So I'm really happy to see you here and to be able to speak with you today. I actually like to address my question to both of you all and get your opinion on something. Um, when you all think of the injustices Blake, uh, facing Black Minnesotans, particularly the fact that oftentimes we have seen Minnesota rated as the second worst place for Black people to live. Um, in, in your opinion, what do you think is the root or the roots of those injustices? What is your specific strategy to address that in a timely manner? And how does the budget support that strategy? It's a great question. I, I'm going to turn to the lieutenant governor to start this because she has a, a saying that I think it's while it 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 is a bit humorous. It's like any good piece of humor. It's cutting to the core of things. She says whenever these questions get asked, Minnesotans say, oh, why don't we have pie? And they move on. I would argue that my point on this is, is that again, and, and just Miss Margaret, just to be clear, I've been touting this week that a major publication, U.S. News, talked about how Minnesota is the second best state in the country to live in. So we'll get caught up in that. If you're white, if you're white, that's certainly true. And I've been saying this, and it's the best state in the country for public education. If you're white, um, as you said, we're second or last. And, and I think it comes from, we do a lot of things right, but I think there is a culture of avoidance of things that make us uncomfortable to talk about. But I'll, I'll defer to the Lieutenant Governor because we've, we've had this conversation for many years as friends. Well, Ms. Margaret, I um, I appreciate your your question, and I think you look great. So you're 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 doing all right. Um, uh, so you know, I think um, 
I'm glad, Governor, that you brought that up because what I, I call those are who wants pie moments, right? When things get difficult, it is the who wants pie, right? Because we can't talk through um, the tough stuff. And because we are unwilling to talk about the tough stuff, uh, we experience the trauma of last summer. And we experience the trauma of losing uh, BIPOC members of our community at higher rates, um, not just to COVID, but to um, uh, you know a, a, a trough of health disparities and inequities. And you know, as you're asking about what is at the root of that, I think the root of it um, is you know goes all the way back to you know the founding of the state, right? Um, on Dakota and uh, Anishinaabe land, um, and that our capital and the infrastructure of the state was built by uh, underpaid and undervalued black and brown people. Um, and so that is the root of it. And you know, our job is to look towards um, to policies and to communities themselves uh, about the solutions that they have. I think too often what happens at the legislature is that you know, or in, and you know, in in politics in general, is folks say I have an idea, and then they move on it instead of uh, going to the community and saying, "What do you think? What solutions do you have?" As the governor just mentioned, education, we know, we know what the answers there are. It is our young people being valued by their education, right? It is in seeing themselves in their curriculum, in their teachers. Um, and it is, you know, knowing that uh, we need to invest um, in the things that we, we know are working. And now it's about the will. I have to tell you, though, that sometimes when we are at the legislature, um, when I say things like white supremacy, um, you know, there are folks uh, primarily on the other side of the aisle who say, you know, we don't need to use inflammatory language. And we're not using inflammatory language. We're simply telling the truth. And I think that that is, um, you know, and I can say these things as a Anishinaabe Kwe, as a native woman, but let me tell you, you know, it hits different <laughs> when the governor says it um, too. And that also matters. I, you know, we need him to also help change the hearts and minds um, of folks who look like the governor, frankly, um, you know, and, and that's certainly something that, that you know, we, we talk about. So there are solutions that are coming out of the community, places and spaces to uh, invest. And our job is to create pathways for those solutions, um, you know, to, to come forward so that, uh, so that they can become a reality. And I think it's changing as we look at the makeup that the, the legislature is changing so that people can speak on their own behalf and speak for themselves in a way that wasn't possible before. And that's frankly when democracy works better um, and best. But it also means that we're not off the hook. Um, I have a responsibility to the black community as a leader in the state of Minnesota um, to, to listen and to hear the solutions and, and what needs to happen. So uh, investing in the places that have been identified and moving forward solutions that are important. And um, you know that is uh, my commitment uh, and the governor's uh, commitment as well. And there's a whole host of things, I think, than policy solutions and investments that we made in this most recent budget but again, we have to keep building and keep pushing. And we also need community to push to make the legislature make these changes. We can propose these things, but we need our partners there to, to make them, you know, um, to get them across the finish line to become law. Ms. Margaret, if I could, Therese, I would just add, and Lieutenant Governor's right, just, just two things of some of those systemic changes. I mean, think about um, this state issues fewer pardons and commutations in any state in the union. Mississippi pardons more people than we do for crime. And we know that incarceration rates are hugely skewed, um, especially to, to black, young black males. Um, issuing a commutation of a 16 year old locked up for life, that's the first time that happened in Minnesota. That is disgraceful to us. Um, you go in our curriculums and folks were shocked that there was a lynching in Duluth a uh, hundred years ago and that we had to pardon Max Nason. And I just, um, 
I just can't get away from this fact that I'm incredibly proud of this state and the things we've done. But if you're proud of this state, then you have to have the courage to say where our weaknesses are. And I would just end your question with something that shook. And this was, I think, Lieutenant Governor, before we've been separated on this. We were up in Duluth talking about racism, talking about Max Nason and, and the lynchings. And there was a woman who relocated to Minnesota from Arkansas. And she said, yeah, there's there's racism in Arkansas, she said. But she said, in Minnesota, the racism's quieter, but it's meaner. And that broke my heart. Um, and she needed to tell me that. And as, as a white man of privilege, you know, I can think I'm enlightened in seeing all this. But here was a young professional Black woman who was telling me, your racism is quiet and mean. Um, and that's dangerous. And so I... We'll talk more. Now you got me on your show. So I'm telling my team. Yes, thank you. We will definitely talk more. <laughs> thank you both. So happy to be here with you all today. Thank you. I'm still kind of mind boggled by how amazing this all is. So excuse me. Uh, next up we have uh, Sheila. Um, and I just want to say like, this is not a thing community media often gets access to this opportunity to ask questions that come from our community. So if I start crying, it's because of that. Like I've been a legislative reporter for 12 years and I've never been able to ask a governor a question in any press conference. Cause I was always the youngest person in the room. Um, I was the only immigrant in the room I was for a long time. So having you here in the space with my team, so many of them who we've trained, um, it feels like maybe the thing I'll be most proud of in my life. So um, well, we are grateful next for and it. And, and we need to change the thinking of people in elected office. Um, we are not doing you a favor by being here. It's our responsibility to be here. And, and we need to do in our administration, just like you heard Miss Margaret say, we need to do a better job of making ourselves more accessible too. So thank you for the persistence and, and changing, changing how this business works. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So um, up next in the 10, 12 minutes we have left, we have Sheila, and then we're going to do uh, Jakara, Darlene, and then Hannah. So we're going to I'll go quick. We'll, we'll do rapid fire. <laughs> okay. So, um, my question kind of got answered um, J uh, by JD's question. So I have a little bit of a, a follow-up about the homelessness um, and housing issue. Um, efforts uh, to end homelessness in the past uh, have faced difficulties, uh, not only because of the enormity of the problem, but also uh, how difficult it is to even count the people that help and reach the people that help. What investments will the state be making, not only to provide that help, but to keep track of people that are falling beneath the cracks, especially as additional people face the crisis when the moratorium is lifted? Yes, Sheila, thank you for the question. First of all, we measure what we value. So your question is right. We have to measure and know where we're at. And we have to not allow people to, um, to, to allow the idea of ending homelessness to be some type of aspirational pie in the sky. It is absolutely doable. It is absolutely measurable. And we know that there are supports and wraparound services that make that happen. And, and I'm going to make the case that I, I spent a lot of years in the military and I, I served as the ranking member in the United States Congress on, on Veterans Affairs. And my top focus was around veteran suicide and veteran homelessness, which go hand in hand. And one of the things that we're seeing is, I can tell you today that I have 271 homeless veterans and I can pinpoint where they're at. Now, we have the resources through the VA, but we have the commitment that we're out there with our partners identifying them. And we have a goal of being the fifth state in the nation to be to, to functionally remove veteran homelessness. And meaning that we know there's people gonna continue to drop into that temporarily, but the safety net is strong, resilient, and ready to respond to make that short-term temporary and move them on to something else. We need to take the same attitude we've done around that into the broader homelessness fight. And I would say Commissioner Ho of Minnesota Housing has that. Um, we're partnering together with these teams that know whether it's, it, it's having accurate counts, it's partnering with sometimes counterintuitive organizations to figure this out. And back in 2019, in the winter of 2019, after Lieutenant Governor and I first came to uh, office, we were horrified by folks having to endure another Minnesota winter out there. And we were going to try and raise a million dollars from the philanthropic community to do something about this. And they said they would match that if we could raise that million dollars in a month. 
Um, we raised five million dollars in three days for that. And when I say we, Minnesotans are with this. So Sheila's question is right. It starts out having accurate counts and access, uh, assessing what the uh, what the actual situation is, recognizing there are many paths to homelessness and there's not one fix to it, and then making clear that if you're going to set a goal on this, it is not aspirational and you need to measure it. I'm, I thought I could have gotten this before 2020 on the veteran side of things, but COVID complicated it, and we need to acknowledge we're not there yet, but I can tell you that we've moved from 681 down to 271 and where those folks are at. So we're committed to it and our budget reflects that, that there's money in there to do those things. Sheila, it's good to see you. This is a, um, a longer conversation because I think we're doing lots of good work through the Interagency Council to End Homelessness. Um, and this has been a priority uh, before COVID. Uh, for me, I'm the chair of the Interagency Council uh, to End Homelessness. Um, and we're digging in and working across agency um, and investing in a way that we just, um, haven't uh, before. So I just want to, I know my team is on here too. Um, let's have a follow-up conversation on, on everything that we're doing around this, this issue, because there's a, a lot um, that we can't answer in, in two minutes. Wonderful. I'll make sure you get connected. Um, Jakara from News on Purpose, also an uptake partner. Hello and good morning, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, panelists. Thank you for being here. So we are in the time of COVID. COVID have wiped our world. And I know we're sick of talking about COVID, right? Sick of hearing about it, sick of having to live in it. But we must ask, how are we going to exist beyond COVID? So my question is, how is the budget set up for life after COVID, including relief for Minnesota's most vulnerable communities, such as black and brown families, the black community, small and minority owned businesses who have been greatly impacted. Thanks, Jakar, and you're exactly right. Um, your question is that we, we, we cannot let fatigue turn us away from understanding that, that there's a lot of recovery to be done. Um, I would state first off that our budget was actually titled, titled the, the COVID recovery budget. Um, it focused on that COVID did not hit all communities equally. Um, BIPOC communities were disproportionately hit by COVID. They're still being disproportionately impacted by lack of vaccine equity that we need to continue to work on. With that being said, we have focused and made the case that there are folks who did very, very well during COVID at the top. And, and we have asked folks that are making a million dollars a year to pay 1% more to invest in our children, to invest in summer school and enrichment opportunities, to invest in... Um, making sure that families have an additional bump up um, in CCAP. And then one of, uh, one of the things the Lieutenant Governor worked on was to change that formula first time in 36 years last year. We need to build on that success, to focus on the homelessness piece of this, to make sure that we're trying to build wealth in communities, to understand that getting back to normal is not good enough for communities that were suffering going into COVID health inequities, educational inequities, housing inequities. So we take this budget and focus on working families, small businesses, and children is where we're gonna to continue to focus. I will say this for all of you that I still don't think it's sunk in to people. This American Rescue Plan that President signed into law has the potential to be one of the biggest social changers since potentially the New Deal or Medicaid and Medicare that many experts conservatively believe that we can reduce childhood poverty by half. Um, this is exciting times, but here's the thing. Community needs to be at the table because who's gonna divide that money? Like Lieutenant Governor said, it's the same people who tend to divide it. And again, we have children who need help right now. And you know what the first order of business that the legislator's doing? They're trying to pass a tax cut. They're trying to pass a tax cut. Um, that is not what we need at this point in time. And, and we're committed to, to leaning into a post-COVID world that acknowledges we went into it with inequities. They are worse now and we better fix them. We've stepped up in a way that we just haven't before across a whole host of, of issues responding to this healthcare crisis, to crisis uh, in, you know, in, in housing, um, uh, around uh, education. So as you mentioned, Jakara, it has impacted every single aspect of our lives. 
That being said, you know, a year ago, some of the things that we've been able to do and how we've responded and removed barriers and tried to just be innovative, um, I wouldn't have believed it a year ago. Now there are other things that we need to tackle um, related to how we can have a more uh, just and equitable state where at this moment, we might not believe are possible, but we've proven over the past year that we can innovate and work together um, to figure these things out. And there's some changes that we've made um, uh, to make um, accessing health and, uh, help and support the communities need easier. We should just keep doing those things. <laughs> and so I think that that is a, a part and a, a, a piece of this too. I love that. Um, so um, I was told that we have actually till 8.50. So we're gonna ask, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read uh, Darlene and then Hannah and then Mackenzie and then we're done. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, good morning, Governor. Good morning, Mr. Governor. Um, my question, um, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be in this space with you guys. Um, another policy issue that uh, districts may require support for is ethnic studies. Um, particular at, uh, particularly as communities fight to disrupt the schools uh, to a prison pipeline. My question is, what kind of support can you offer uh, the fight in ethnic studies? Well, Darlene, thank you for the question. I, maybe some folks on here don't know. Um, my background is in cultural geography. I'm a cultural geography teacher, which is basically the beauty of diversity and the multitude of voices and contributions. Um, our social studies standards need to be updated. They need to make sure that they are including those voices. And as I'm so often told, it, it's one thing to have a, a committed ally of a, of a teacher who understands this, it's much more impactful, as Lieutenant Governor says, to make sure that those histories are being told by community members to students. And, and I agree with you that we've seen the rise of, uh, of ethnocentrism, uh, of white supremacy, of xenophobia, uh, and it man it's, uh, manifests itself in violence, which we've seen. And again, right now, I'm, I'm deeply concerned with the attacks on our Asian Pacific Islander community um, because of the ignorance around um, a virus. And so it starts out with, and I think all of us on this call know this, that there's good and bad news about this white supremacy and racism. It is, it is growing. The good news about it is, is it is a learned behavior. We do not have to accept it. Um, we need to put safeguards in for hate crimes and those types of things. But the real solution is moving back up and what Darlene's asking about, making sure that our curriculum is, is done in a way that values uh, all, that, that welcomes that. And... Um, and ensures that the community's voices are being taught in a way that, that we don't get into this position. I mean, there's such dangerous language out there um, about how we teach our children. So I, I think you're right. If you really wanna start walking back down the line to the core of our, a lot of our problems, um, one of them is, is that our students need this well-rounded education. So Lieutenant Governor's kind of leading up the, the, the change on social studies standards, especially around this issue. So Peggy. Yeah, so there's sort of two paths. There's the social studies standards that are being updated, um, which are, uh, this happens every 10 years. I'm grateful that the governor and I are in office as this change is happening because the social studies uh, standards uh, advisory group looks like the state of Minnesota. And I think that that is uh, a big piece. The second um, part of it, uh, Darlene, is uh, we have funding um, in our budget for ethnic studies, uh, because as the governor said, uh, he certainly knows, and I absolutely know the, the value um, of that. And our kids continue to, you know, to be taught uh, one uh, perspective of history. Um, and then, you know, uh, oftentimes when they get to college, suddenly they're told the truth. And I think our young people can handle the truth um, a lot earlier. And it's also one of the reasons why we create, we, um, uh, put indigenous education for all also as part of our budget. So it's not just that native kids need to learn about their own culture and history. It's that, you know, the first 10 to 15 minutes of any conversation that I as an indigenous person have with someone, we have to sort of do indigenous 101. Um, our young people are living on uh, Dakota and Anishinaabe land. They should know, and the name of our state is uh, Minnesota. 
um, which comes from Minnesota, uh, you know, Makochi. And so, um, you know, again, having a teacher as, as governor uh, is helpful uh, because he understands um, the need to have our curriculum um, uh, reflect our students. And also it is the thing, it is the secret sauce that opens up the door. I didn't have a teacher who looked like me until I was a sophomore at the University of Minnesota. And it was in American Indian Studies, um, Dr. Brenda Child, and my whole life changed. And my whole educational experience changed. And I know that my story is not unique. We shouldn't wait till our young people are sophomores in college. We should start that in kindergarten, right? Because um, they're ready for it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I will say I'm a, I'm a teacher as well. I teach social justice and community organizing for a very small hippie liberal arts college in Northern Arizona online um, where I also have my degree. And we talk a lot about how do we make sure our classrooms look like our students? And so yeah. this hits close to home with a lot of the discussions that we have um, in that department in the you know global studies program. So um, up next we have uh, Hannah and then Mackenzie. Hi, yeah. Governor Waltz, Independent Governor, thank you both so much for being here. Um, my question is this, um, are there any aspects of the budget or budget negotiations that you feel are being misunderstood? And are there any parts in particular that come to mind that you wanna talk about? Well, I would just say that this gets, you know, it gets archaic as the Lieutenant Governor says, it's, it's not just a euphemism that behind closed doors is really how these things happen. Um, I think our secret weapon has been, we, we take our budget to the people. We talk about what things are in there. Um, it's, it's almost stunning to me that, um, that we see people trying to defend folks who, uh, who did so incredibly well during COVID can't pay a little bit more to help the rest of us out. And I, I think in this budget around the tax proposals, that's the one we need to talk about. Our proposals, cut taxes for those working families that really need the difference. Um, and that makes sense because we can still have the revenues necessary to fund our schools, build our roads, um, do all of the things we need to do in a more equitable manner. I had a statistic, just this just stuns me. The 12 richest people in the world, um, if we took just what they made during 2020, the extra, not all their money, just what they made above 2019, that's enough money to vaccinate every single person in the world. And those 12 people would still be the richest people in the world. And so I think our budget talks about progressiveness in a way that income inequity is going to destroy not only this country, but it will destroy any chance of the world continuing to progress. And we are really focused on this, this idea of, of a fairness in the tax code, in a fairness in how we do things. And what you'll hear is, is the simple argument that those who oppose us will say the governor wants to tax everybody. Nope, just those making a million dollars a year. Um, and, and I think that part is misunderstood and people get nervous um, talking about it. And I think even progressives get nervous talking about it because they feel like it's not a winning argument. Most folks believe that we all do better when we all do better. And one of the ways we do that is making sure there's an equitable tax system. So I think that's pretty misunderstood. And it's one that I wanna spend some time talking to Minnesotans about. Yeah, if you make over $20,000 a week, um, those are the folks who are gonna be tasked. If you don't make over $20,000 a week, you're gonna be just fine. So just putting that, uh, putting that out there. But I think just generally, um, you know, when it comes to negotiations and budget negotiations, as the governor said, these things happen behind closed doors. Um, however, uh, as you know, we also have gone to community um, to hear what are the pieces that need to be part of the budget. All the things that we've just talked about um, during our time with you are the things that we're gonna keep fighting for. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, you know, we, we need, um, we need folks to know, and that uh, you know the legislature is our partner in this. We can't, um, we don't control the purse strings. We don't, um, you know, we can't uh, uh, determine. You know, we can't spend that money. We can spend the money. We just can't allocate that money. That is the the role of the the legislature. So I think sometimes that gets a little misconstrued, but. Um, but yeah, all the things that we, we lifted up here, um, equity in the budget, making sure um, that uh, we push back against this notion that you can somehow cut your way to prosperity or, you know, um, 
uh, cut your way to a place where people who um, you know, have been most impacted are somehow made whole uh, through those cuts. Um, that's the stuff that we need to, to push uh, back against. Um, and, uh, you know, can't do that all by ourselves. Um, we need, you know, community also to make sure that the, the narrative of how real people um, have been impacted are, are also part of this conversation. Wonderful. Uh, last question, Mackenzie, we'll do it rapid fire and then give you some chance for final thoughts. Good morning, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. It's very nice to meet you and speak with you today. My question is, what is the mechanism to ensure that racial equity is articulated and continues to be prioritized in your budget? For example, is there someone who can ensure that racial equity is realized in the governor's budget? As I know that that is a high priority for both of you, and I'm really excited to see the work that you're doing come to fruition. Yeah, it's a great question, McKinsey, and I think Lieutenant Governor's point was well taken on that, that we can put out a budget, but the legislature, just to be candid with you, last time I put out a budget, um, the, the leaders in the Senate, the Republican leadership in the Senate, wouldn't even read it or give it a hearing. It means they didn't even open it up. They didn't even look at it. They, didn't, they said, well, that's nice, and they, they literally threw it away. Um, that's kind of what we're up against. So what I'm and I'll, I'll let the Lieutenant Governor talk about some of these things. It's like the bonding and setting some, some baseline things in law that, that will outlive us. I am deeply concerned we're making progress on progressive issues, but we're only in these positions as long as the, the public allows us to be. And once we leave, if there's a desire to not do equity, I don't want it to be just the choice of who sets in this seat. So we're trying to codify these things, if you will, to put root into the budget to make sure that they're there no matter who sets in the seat, that they will have to do equity and bonding. They will have to make sure that procurement from state government reaches a certain percentage that goes to uh, ethnically diverse uh, entrepreneurs. And um, Lieutenant Governor, maybe you could talk about a few of the details, but this was the genius of what the Lieutenant Governor did around bonding. It, it's stunning to me, it never happened before, that there was a set formula that had to be adhered to for bonding? Um, so part of the, <laughs> part of the thing that, that happens um, here to me, just if I can be just really honest with you, is um, being in the room where it happens. Um, sometimes I look around and I'm like, oh, I'm really here. Uh, because for so long, um, our folks haven't had access to the, the table. So um, I would say that is something that is, is different. And we're going to just keep pushing um, uh, you know, for, uh, for policies that are equitable. But it goes all the way back to um, when we're asking our agencies and um, our, our policy staff, and of course people know, you know what the priorities are for the governor and I, but everybody who brings a proposal forward um, that would get included in our, either our budget or the policies that, that we wanna move forward through the governor's office, they have to say, this is how um, uh, equity, right, is part of this proposal. Um, and so who will be impacted um, uh, and who they've talked to in the community about this particular proposal. So that's built in um, to the beginning of how we put our proposals uh, together. I can't speak to uh, how the House or Senate does that, but that's how our office operates. Um, so we're trying to bake it in um, throughout um, throughout the the entire process, um, and I you know and I would just uh, say this that we also have heard a lot of feedback from community org based organizations, um, oftentimes smaller nonprofits who are like we don't have big dog grant writers right like you know ten or twenty people who are working on this stuff we have a staff of five who do everything, but we also are deeply embedded in the community and know what our community needs. So we are changing the way that we do equity and grant making as well, which isn't something we necessarily have to, you know, have the, the legislature do. We can do that as an agency, um, but also have to change. Um, that's something that we also need to change for the long term. So long after the governor and I are gone, this simply becomes the way that we, um, that we do business. So uh, and I would say the way that we ensure that equity is, is still part of this process is all of you telling and showcasing the stories that impact um, our communities. Uh, because um, 
the system, uh, I think about this every day when I go, you know, when I go to the Capitol when it's open, right, is that um, the system was not created by us or for us, but in many ways was created to eliminate us or to silence us. And so um, the role of, of community media is like, it's the thing that will allow our voices um, uh, to be heard um, and to tell the full narrative and story about who is in being impacted and what happened. So, um, you know, long story long, just coming back to this point that I am really grateful, and I know the governor is too, for being able to, to spend this time with all of you. Um, I think we'll probably do this again um, and, uh, you know, and just know um, what an important uh, role you all play in making sure that we're shining a light um, on the, the things that um, maybe have happened in darkness uh, for, for a while to ensure that um, our people are, are reflected um, in these documents, um, these budget documents and policies that we're, we're moving forward. Um, okay, actually crying now. Um, thank you both so much for being here. We are way over our time. I did let uh, Pluan know that I was going to send a question, um, both of your way, about the intersections of COVID-19, health insurance, and accessibility and equity yep. within that. But, but we definitely don't have time to get into that now, because I spent an hour with the Department of Health yesterday, and I'm still trying to get it. Um, thank you both for being here. Any final thoughts? Um, and then we will let you go. Well, no. Thanks, Serene. We'll follow up on your question. And um, I'm just grateful for all of you. Lieutenant Governor's right, you need to tell the story. Our belief is, is that um, that a free press is the foundation of democracy. Uh, it, it We've seen the attack on that over the last few years. Um, and that means telling stories that, that may not be flattering. Uh, we expect to be held accountable. We expect people to tell those stories and we expect that access to information matters. So Serene, I'm gonna suggest you, should you choose to do this and our staff is on there, that we try and make this a little more regular um, opportunity for your folks to get on, not just as a one-shot deal, where it becomes a little more of a, of a pattern, whether it's quarterly or whatever you decide, or, or they're able to work out, if, if you so wish. We absolutely do. And we definitely want to bring in additional partners. Having this streamed right now on public access television in St. Paul, we're able to get to our communities, but we have partners with North News and the East Side Freedom Library and so many other groups who have questions for this work and have questions about your work and questions about what's happening in the work that impacts our lives. So we wanna keep asking those questions um, and I will work with your team to continue getting those scheduled. That's a great equity so tool for us. We're grateful. Yeah. It is, media has power, but community media, er, Half the people on these call are people we trained and pay from pitch to promotion. Most of the people on this call, half the people at least, are not people who were ever trained as journalists. We worked yep. with them and we trained them and we paid them. It's so authentic and so we great. appreciate it. So thank awesome. you all. We're so thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll let them go. And then um, can the administrator from SPNN stop the TV stream? And let me.